Thank you. Uh, Okay. Ah, it's good to see Edward is back. Yeah. Been missing for a few weeks. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you first uh, for what you said. And yeah, I was abroad for some time and I didn't feel really uh, could mm -hmm. not connect. Hi, Gila. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Dalit. Nice to see you all here. And hi, Edward, long time. <laughs> <laughs> Good to be back. <laughs> um... <clears throat> Hi, Valda. Hi, Dalit. Your camera is off. Oh. In a on. It off? אני במצב של עקיצות בכל הגוף ובלגן. אינגליש. No, you no need. היי גשימה. היי. Nice to have you today with us. I'll just make you co-host. Maybe I can make you. Sure. English lesson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you are the speaker. Okay, great. So let's start. All right. Okay, let's start with some breathing meditation, just focusing on the breath. Moving in and out, being completely in the present. And then to feel inspired, visualize in the space in front of you, a large open lotus, a sun disk and a moon disk. Seated on which is your Lama in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. Was an embodiment of all enlightened beings. He 
his body is of light. And he wears the saffron robes of a monk. He's seated in the full lotus posture, his right hand in the earth touching gesture and his left resting in his lap in the meditation gesture, holding a begging bowl. His smiling, compassionate gaze is directed at you and simultaneously all other sentient beings. And then think that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. Quietly seated all around you. Reminding us why we're here. And by remembering that on both a conventional and an ultimate level, the nature of the mind of all sentient beings and that of a Buddha doesn't differ. And then generate a sense of closeness towards all sentient beings. Again, based on an understanding of the nature of their mind and our mind. Not actually being different. Being clear and knowing. And everything else is merely adventitious, temporary. And so based on the understanding that their well-being is just as important as ours, generate affectionate love. Feeling sentient beings are a part of us. And then spend a moment focusing on all the unwanted experiences sentient beings continuously have. There are different sufferings, fears, unhappiness, depression. And other forms of physical and mental pain. and generate the sincere wish, may they be free from all these unwanted experiences and from whatever causes them. 
And may I be able to protect them from all these Try to generate that wish, that aspiration from the depth of your heart. And it then gives way to, way to the altruistic attitude that is determined to spend this life and all lives to come in the effort to helping sentient beings to overcome all their unwanted experiences, all the different types of suffering and their causes. And it's based on these states of mind, affectionate love and so forth, that we then generate bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, that driven by great love and compassion, wishes to become, aspires or is determined to become fully enlightened for the benefit of each and every sentient being. And so, without forgetting the Buddha right in front of us, all sentient beings surrounding us and our aspiration to become fully enlightened. Let's recite a prayer. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. All right, so I'll start to share it. Huh. Just a sec. Uh. Oh, now I've got a problem. <laughs> I don't know how to share because I'm not using my laptop today because it's breaking down to the humidity. But do you have the, the material or you don't have anything? Yes, I've got everything. I just can't. It tells me I have to allow Zoom to share the screen. Yeah, you do, you do the green screen, the share screen. Yes, and then it says uh, allow Zoom to share to share the screen and then 
for some reason it doesn't allow me to do that oh, do, do you want to start with the answer question or with the pdf that you sent to us um actually with the lamb room could you show the um, lamb um uh, i do have problem with the lamb room okay never Just mind then. Moment. i i will okay. let try to oh. I don't know why this is. <clears throat> oh, maybe I can do this. Just a sec. No, it doesn't. I do have some problem yet with my computer about okay. the PDF film. All right. Wait, wait, let me try one thing. I'm sorry for this, the humidity. Did something? Oh, now it works. Okay, that should work now. I do have the answer question, and uh, what did you send to us? The prayer, of, not the prayer. They were the first okay. chapter. Oh, okay. I'll be able to record them. Let's quit. Uh, okay, so now Zoom tells me I have to quit. Zoom will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it's quit. You can choose to quit Zoom now or do it later. Hmm. So you want to go out and then go in? You prefer to do it like this? Maybe better it will use. Should I try that? Okay. Come All back. right. Okay, let's just do that. Just a sec. I'll just quit it. Um, okay. All right, let's see what that works this time. Um, it says host disabled. Oh, no, you are now co-host, yeah. Okay, great. Right. Co oh, there we go, it worked. Great, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Zoom, US. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's where we got to last time. The root afflictions, we went through them. So to remember for this week as well as part of our study, reflection and meditation of the Lamrim, to remember that the root cause, of course, we're trying to eliminate that by eliminating the misapprehension, the root misapprehension which becomes a root of misapprehension simply because of the object that it perceives, the object that it holds on to. And then it gives rise to all these other afflictions that control our life, that are with us at all times. So to really get that sense, and again, just from your own personal experience, my life is driven by attachment, by aversion, by arrogance, ignorance, and so forth. Now, when you look at these um, 10, actually, affliction here, you've got attachment, aversion, or anger. It's slightly different, but sometimes used interchangeably. Then you've got pride or arrogance, ignorance, and defiled doubt. Those are described as non-views, non as in like more emotional uh, afflictions. So afflictive emotions, as we usually call them. 
ignorance is a little tricky here because ignorance seems to be much more of a view, just a wrong view. But it actually refers to a wrong view. Yes, on one hand, it does. But it's also this kind of just not knowing, being in the dark about things. So it has both aspects, like perceiving things that do exist to be non-existent in the case of karma and so forth, but also having that kind of darkness, this mental darkness um, of not knowing at the same time as this misapprehension. So it's explained slightly differently, but it's not... It's not like what is called the five views. So the afflicted views, as it says here, as the F, here it says F, afflicted views, and then these fives, these five views. So they're often also called afflicted wisdom in that their function is they're very clear, they're very uh, focused, not with this ignorant aspect necessarily, or not with that ignorant aspect uh, per se, but rather it's like this strong view of the transitory collection. So it works actually like wisdom. It's kind of a pretty determined kind of mind, I guess you could say, or or uh, not single pointed, no, but um, it's pretty clear in that sense. So it's called afflicted wisdom. Why? Because, well, its object doesn't exist. So it's, of course, not an actual wisdom. It's an afflicted wisdom. But there's some similarity between wisdom and that mind, I guess, just in terms of feeling so clear about its object and so forth. But, of course, all these five, they're, like I said, they're afflictions. They're not wisdom. They're just rational types of minds. And they all arise from our root misapprehension. So the view of the transitory collection, what does that mean? It's a really weird way of describing a a wrong view. It refers to our sense of, well, focusing on the I, on me, and not another I, not another person. In this case, it's just me. And perceiving that I, that me, that I, that person, that self, to exist inherently. And because this view of the I existing inherently is based on a collection of aggregates which are changing, which are transitory, therefore it's called the view of the transitory collection. So it's the view uh, of an inherent I that is based on this mind and body. And that's, well, it's mentioned first, it's the, the view that is with us most of the time, if not at all times. Some would say it's always with us. And it always, it's that view that informs all our activities, our thoughts, mental activities, our thoughts. Uh, and it, it informs what we say, what we, what, how we act. So that view of the transitory collection, that's what we need to look out for. And it holds on to I and mine. So even if it holds on to my body, the I is still involved because it's the body of the I, the body of me. So it's it's always a self-grasping mind. It's always a mind that grasps the self to exist in a way in which it doesn't exist. So the focus is always on the I, one's own self. And that's the first of the afflicted views. Really something to look out for. I mean, it's, like I said, it forms all our actions. It influences all our actions of body, speech, and mind. And then you have the view holding to extreme or holding to an extreme or to extremes where um, you take that I, well, the I which actually does exist. So in the case of the view of the transitory collection, of course, it, it, it takes the conventional I and perceives that to exist inherently Um, based on mind and body, the merely, labeled I is perceived to exist in and of itself. In the second case, the view holding to an extreme, it holds the conventional I that is merely labeled, it holds on to it being either permanent, non-changing, um, eternal, to go on forever, unchanging, or it holds on to it going out of existence in that we have a sense after death, we will disappear. We will be gone. The eye will be gone. That is, the, so there are these two views. 
one view of permanence, of literally perceiving the self, the conventional I, to be unchanging, and for that unchanging self to go on forever, or the sense that one day I'll disappear. When I die, I'll go out of existence. That would be the other extreme. And then there's the conception of an incorrect view as supreme, holding certain wrong views and considering these wrong views to be supreme, to be even proud of them. I hold this view that there is no karma, that there are my actions don't have consequences. I hold this view, I don't know, whatever. Uh, if I torture my body, I'll attain some form of spiritual liberation and so forth. Uh, so holding this view as supreme, holding the view of an inherent I and feeling that to be supreme, holding it that on to that to be supreme. So, I mean, of course, we're going through those in order to recognize them within ourselves. Do I hold certain views that are actually, well, incorrect views that I consider to be supreme, that consider to be supreme I'm even proud of, possibly? And then there's the next, is the conception of improper ethics and conduct as supreme. So to follow certain spiritual, and usually it's it's referred to spiritual ethics and a certain spiritual conduct as supreme, which in actuality harms us. So for instance, considering, I don't know, in Christianity, of mortification of the flesh, to hit yourself and mortify yourself, I mean, like, yeah, beat yourself up and so forth as a form of um, spiritual conduct or traditionally in India, depriving your body of food, not to take food and drink and considering that to be a spiritual practice, ritual suicide or uh, actions of killing other sentient beings, animals as some kind of ritual offering. So all these, from a Buddhist point of view, are seen as improper ethics. They're seen as, as harmful conduct. And considering these to be supreme, so harming ourselves and others, well, that would be a conception of improper ethics and conduct, seeing, considering that to be supreme. And then incorrect views, well, actually, all the other ones are incorrect views, but they're in particular views such as there's no karma, my actions won't have consequences, there's no reincarnation and so forth. So any, any kind of incorrect view that hasn't been included in the first four is incorrect views. And the difference between ignorance and those, I guess it's, it's got more of that kind of mental darkness of not really knowing, of being confused, whereas these ones are possibly less confused. So this is my understanding of the difference between those. And then defiled doubt, I haven't talked about that. I mean, actually doubt is a good thing if it's a temporary state where you're skeptical and you question what you learn and have your doubts about it in order to then clear that doubt, in order to remove the doubt. But afflicted or defiled doubt is a kind of doubt that never goes away, that we'll always doubt however good the reasoning that is presented, however clear the explanation, it's like we're always two-pointed. We never come to some kind of conclusion on it, on, about every, anything. So it's always the sense, oh, I don't know. Oh, is Dharma practice good or not? Are my afflictions good or bad? Are they or not? So this constant, and the Tibetans use this, um, this analogy. They say it's like trying to stitch with a two-pointed needle. So your mind is two-pointed, so it can never go in one direction, just as you can't stitch with a two-pointed needle. Likewise, you can't really go this way or that way because it holds you back, like your, your doubt. Maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that. All right. So those are the afflictions I would like you to uh, spend some time on if, you, if you're interested to see, check the within your practice, but also throughout your own, through your own day, I mean, through throughout your daily life, like how often is the view of the transitory collection present? And I mean, I don't think we need to be surprised that it's there most of the time, but also a sense of the eye is permanent, or maybe even I'll go out of existence after death, etc. With the other ones, well, it's to be seen. Uh, but anyway, to get an understanding of them, and then of course, try and recognize them in yourself. 
So that would be for the lumbering practice as part of um, the practices that are common to a person of middling spiritual capacity or the, the practices of a person, the practices common to a person who's uh, focusing on liberation. Okay. And then I'd like to... Oh, no, that's the wrong. Yeah, this is Jimmy's questions or a few questions. I, I won't cover all of them, but um, they fit quite nicely into what I'm going to do today. Um, and again, they allow me to give you a bit of a background. So this, this is just clearer. So this is the picture he's referring to, or this is the idea he's referring to. Um, yeah, so here it's just not as clear. But anyway, um, so he asked, what do you mean by perceiving here? Okay, so you've got these three causes and you've got the eye consciousness perceiving a tree. What does perceive mean here? Do we mean by perceiving, do we mean imputing? No, no. Um, perceiving is a little difficult. That word is slightly difficult to to explain, I mean, in Tibetan as well as in English. We usually talk about a mind having two characteristics. It's clear and knowing. You've probably all heard that. Any mind has these two characteristics. So clear means, in other words, anything can appear to the mind. If you think about it, it appears to your mind. Then with the sense consciousnesses, as long as it's a visual object, it can appear to the mind. Well, Okay, there are, of course, some restrictions if it's extremely subtle. It does appear, yes, it appears, but we're not aware of it. But anyway, we could usually say that anything, any visual objects can, um, object can appear to an eye consciousness. Uh, to a mental consciousness, there are no restrictions in terms of visual or audio or whatever, auditory or whatever. Anything can appear. So in general, we can say anything can appear to the mind. That's just the first characteristic. The second characteristic, it says knowing, but that is basically saying having the potential to know because not every mind knows its object, but included in that is that every mind perceives its objects or apprehends its object. And that doesn't necessarily, like I just said, mean it knows, knows its object. So what does perceive mean? It actually in English is defined as uh, being aware, being conscious. So not just something appearing, but there's a conscious aspect, uh, an aware aspect of the mind. Now, when it comes to the sense consciousnesses, so mental consciousnesses, they can do more than that. On top of that, they can think about the object. They're aware of the object, but they can think about it. They can assume it to be correct. They can doubt it. They can get angry with it, attached to it. All these are functions that a mental consciousness can perform. The sense consciousnesses are way more limited in what they can do. So something appears to the sense consciousnesses, yes, and something is then apprehended. And just check your own mind while listening to this explanation. Like your eye consciousness, you're seeing something right now. Something is appearing to your mind. And your mind is aware of something, okay? The object on your screen, for instance. Now, perceiving here can mean to know its object, but it can also mean that it's aware, but doesn't realize its object. So when you're distracted and you're looking at the screen, but you're thinking of something, or you're listening to, the, to my voice and your mind is aware. Your mind is always aware. As long as there's a, an object, it's aware. It perceives something. But later on, you have no recollection because you, your mind didn't realize the object. And it, the, the understanding that the mind had in that moment wasn't passed on to a conceptual mind. So it wasn't ascertained by a conceptual mind. And so we have a lot of these sense consciousnesses that are, although they're aware, but later on, there's no recollection of that. It's not like we forgot. It, it just never went further to the level of a conceptual mind, which then 
enables us to later recollect that or to remember that. That's what perceiving means here. So when we talk strictly of a sense consciousness, a sense consciousness doesn't impute. For instance, in the very beginning, I think I gave you this handout, I think it was called Emptiness and Dependent Rising. And I spoke about a labeling mind is a mind that thinks it's this, it's that, and so forth. So that is impossible for an eye consciousness or any sense consciousness for that matter. It does not impute, it doesn't think. Okay, so is it therefore this to answer that question that an act of imputation takes place in the eye consciousness? Does the eye consciousness label? Of course not. No, not at all. It just uh, directly perceives visual objects, right? I mean, of course, in this those that are in the sphere of our vision. Uh, not the ones behind myself, unless I turn around, I mean, not behind us, but in the sphere of our vision, those objects, the mind perceives. So it does not impute. Is that what we call here by the name perceiving? No, perceiving is just that it's aware. Could then we say instead, dependent on those three conditions, the eye consciousness is imputing a tree? No, no. There is imputation taking place later on like let's say it's not part of the drawing here but independence on the three conditions and eye consciousness arises and then if the eye consciousness knows tree realizes tree then it gives rise to a conceptual mind that also perceives tree also knows tree and that conceptual mind it's like a thinking mind like oh tree and that labels it labels that's a labeling mind so let's say in this in the case of this example the eye consciousness perceives tree because the person is aware knows what a tree is so the eye consciousness is able to perceive tree and that then is gives rise to the thought oh tree and that's automatically a labeling mind every time there's a thought tree the mind labels it's not like you label only at the very beginning when you learn language. No, you label every thought you have. There is a process of labeling. It is this, it is that, and so forth. Okay. So, therefore, in dependence on the three conditions, you could say that later on the conceptual mind imputes a tree based on what the eye consciousness previously perceived. Otherwise, there seems to be a problem here. According to the above illustration, the uncommon dominant condition and the observed condition together form the source, the sense spheres or the sense sources. The sense, yeah, so it should be here, sense sources or sense spheres. Okay, is that right? Yes. We discussed that last time, I think. However, the problem is that in our experience, the above two conditions are blended together. How do we separate our eyes, for example, from the visual form that is supposed to be beyond the eyes? We cannot, he goes on. For example, how do I know if I'm seeing merely my own eyes or some object, object beyond my eyes? I don't think you're seeing your own eyes. I think what you mean is here, how do I know I see the actual object versus the subjective experience I have with my eye consciousness? Because I don't think we naturally have a sense that the eyes or the eyes sense power and the object are the same. I mean, we talk about the eye, I saw it with my own eyes. So there's a separation between my eyes seeing it. Therefore, I believe what you mean is more there's one thing I think I, I guess I need to mention. When we study the mind, when in Buddhist philosophy you study about the mind, it's one of the first topics. One of the first topics called lorik. You learn about the nature of the mind. You learn about its object, what the different types of mind do with their object. Um, think about it versus just perceiving it and so forth. So it's uh, a very extensive explanation on the different divisions of mind, etc. Now, this explanation is given from the point of view of the Satantrika school or the Sutra school, which is one of the lower schools, lower from the point of view of their view on emptiness, not in terms of their understanding of the mind. I mean, their understanding of the mind is very sophisticated. And we learn 
everything on the mind based on their school. Now, what this school accepts, and that acceptance is part of what we learn, that there's this objective world out there. So this objective world, there's a car, or I don't know, a tree out there, and this tree, it, 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 this, this, this image of the tree, it's reflected where it appears to my sense faculty. So it's the object and my sense faculty interacting by way of this tree appearing to my sense faculty. So you could say to the retina on the eye, for instance, using uh, more modern terminology. And based on that, an eye consciousness arises. But how about, so usually we accept it this way, but when you move into Prasangika, I mean, mine only anyway, but also Prasangika, well, what about the modern explanation that colors, for instance, are merely light waves? How does that fit in? Well, it fits in perfectly. We just need to let go of this view of the Satantrika. The object is out there. It exists exactly the way it appears to me because that's their view. They do talk about the self of the eye, yes, but in terms of phenomena other than the eye, everything exists the way it appears to us. Um, so oftentimes Lurik is explained from in that way, but when we think about it and we take into consideration the higher schools, such as the Prasangika school, well then the modern scientific explanation, there's no object out there, how we perceive it, we perceive we have a totally subjective experience, makes complete sense. It makes total sense. So there is something externally there. There is an external object. Conventionally, there is. But our experience of what is externally there is very unique. And so your eye sense faculty and the object interacting means that the object doesn't exist exactly out there the way we perceive it. The same is true for sound as well. And I guess this is what you mean. And if I'm wrong, then please uh, mention it next time, Jimmy, but or Jim. But the thing is, um, I don't think you literally mean that your own eyes appear to you or that you're seeing your own eyes. You're seeing with your own eyes. And of course, the, 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 the sense faculty itself, it also influences. I mean, if you need to wear glasses and you don't wear glasses, then the object will only appear in a blurry, blurry. I mean, it will only like a, a blurry appearance of the object. It won't be as sharp. Um, anyway, so I guess, yes, this interaction of those two definitely, definitely takes place. And therefore... This modern scientific explanation goes perfectly with the Prasangika school. Um, that yes, there's an external object, and we call that a tree, for instance, but it doesn't exist the way it appears to us. And likewise, heat, we talk about external heat, but without our body experiencing it as heat, it wouldn't be heat. Um, if it experienced totally different by someone else, well, we can only talk about a conventional existence, but not something out there objectively existent. But like I said, since the explanation on mind and mental factors and the functions of mind and so forth are explained from the point of view of the Satantrika school, usually we may be under the impression that that all the other schools, when they talk about the mind, they're accepting that. But no, of course they don't in actuality. Like I said, the scientific explanation works perfectly with the Prasangika school, but not with the Satantrika school. They would have a problem with that. What are you saying, light waves? No, there's a tree out there. In the same way as it appears, appears to me, in that way it exists out there, which is also the case for sound and so forth. Okay. Um, I have that problem usually in daily life because I cannot know if I'm seeing anything beyond my eyes or touching anything beyond my skin. No, beyond your eyes is impossible. You only perceive. And of course, again, science is so helpful in that way that how much we can actually perceive with our eyes. I mean, eagles, they can see so much more or touching anything beyond our skin, not at all. Without, because those two conditions are blended together, forming one single image. They're not blended together, but they interact. They're different, 
they don't blend to the trees over there and my eye sense powers here, but they interact in such a way that they form a single subjective image, one single entity. How do we solve this? Does this problem only arise if we assume true existence? No, I don't think so. So maybe I just totally misunderstood the question, but I still don't see how you have a sense that you see your own eyes. So please, um, maybe um, comment on that if there's if, if it hasn't been solved yet. And on the other hand, if we work with imputations only, then the above problem does not arise because everything is merely labeled. Okay, all right. But there's a basis which based on which we do label um, but yes, it makes much more sense to say there's a tree out there um, based on the appearance we have. We then label this tree is green, this tree is, has this shape and this color, although these colors don't exist out there in the way in which they appear. So I guess, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I'll, I'll answer one more question because this I think is important. Abiding. <laughs> arising, abiding, and ceasing. That also takes me to what I wanted to start today's class with. Because honestly, the word, for instance, arising, it is just not a word we use a lot in our daily life. It's a bit, it's a bit difficult, but the, the verb in English works so well here that a lot of translators chose this word. It actually really means to come into existence. Arising is another way of saying come into existence. So to arise means to come into existence. And here in this context, independence on causes and conditions. All right. So arising is really that. I, I could say come into existence, but it's really long. So I mention it sometimes, but... I'd settle for arising because it works grammatically. It's short. It's it's yeah. It's it's easy to use it. Um, there's also a, um, a, a footnote on that particular term that I go through if we come to it today. It's quite important. So we're just borrowing this odd word from the English language and kind of redefine it. And it really means to come into existence and dependence on causes and conditions. Okay. And why do we talk so much about arising? I mentioned that before. Well, if we want to understand how phenomena exist, the focus being on impermanent phenomena. We're not attached to permanent phenomena. We don't get angry with permanent phenomena. So we shouldn't ignore them. They do exist. However, we're attached to, we get angry with impermanent phenomena. So it's the impermanent that is the focus on here. In, in Nagarjuna's text, the focus is on impermanent phenomena. And they happen to arise, to abide, and to, to, to cease as well. So they arise, they abide, and they cease. So why do we start with the rising? Because it starts with that. So first they come into existence. So to not just analyze the objects themselves, but also to analyze how they come into existence. But... The problem is that we get a little bit confused about rising, abiding, and ceasing. Because it seems so easy to say, oh, rising, abiding, and ceasing, they happen at the same time. There is simultaneous. They're not. Okay, but first, let me just go through this. So, can be either. So, these three can be either sequential or simultaneous, depending on the different levels of conventions. So, my reasoning, by the conventions of the world, arising, abiding, and ceasing happen in sequence. Is this a valid conventional truth? I think so. However, in the experience of the yogi, focusing on subtle impermanence, no matter how closely she looks, she cannot find any length of abiding. So she must conclude that arising, abiding, and ceasing happen simultaneously. No, they don't happen simultaneously, even on the subtlest level, because arising precedes the other two. Arising happens at the time of the cause of something. So at the time of the seed, the sprout has not arisen yet. It is arising. It is coming into existence. Once it has come into existence, we say it's a sprout. 
Doesn't that make sense? Um, it's it's so much easier if, if it were arising, abiding, and ceasing happen. Simon, it would be so much easier because uh, grammatically it's the same ending, so um, the same form. So it seems really easy. But and a lot of a lot of in a lot of texts it gets mixed up. For instance, I've noticed in the translation um, Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary, um, what's it called, Ocean of Reasoning, it gets mixed up. Here, sometimes the translators say arising, sometimes arisen. When in Tibet, when in Tibetan, it says it uses clearly the the past tense. They use the present tense, such as arising, and that can get a little confusing. So it's really important that coming into existence, if something comes into existence, it's not there yet. When it has come into existence, is there? So that's the difference. When it comes into existence, it is about to arise. It's like all the causes and conditions are there and it's in the process of arising. So the process of arising is the same as arising, which means arising happens at the time of the cause. Abiding and ceasing happen when the thing is there. So at that time, it has arisen, it abides, and it ceases. And that happens simultaneously. So having arisen, abiding, and ceasing, they happen simultaneously. Okay. And on a course level, yes, and I agree with Jim here. Uh, I agree with him when he says on the course level, it seems first arising, then abiding, and then ceasing. Because we look at it in a different way. What, what does arising mean? Like a child first, it's slowly born. And then it's there for some time. And then it dies. Right? We look at it in a very coarse way. So here there are just these coarse kind of stages in our life. Um, and so from that point of view, yeah, that's valid, but it's a, it's a coarse conventional truth. Um, Jim later also uses the word higher conventional truth. Well, it's just coarse and subtle. Subtle being less obvious, not as manifest, not manifest like subtler. So on a subtle level, he, as he writes here, focusing on subtle impermanence, no matter how closely the yogi looks, she cannot find any length of abiding. So she must conclude that having arisen, abiding and ceasing happen simultaneously. No? Well, not, not, not just because there can't be any abiding, cannot, it can't be found, but there's a basis of imputation for all three. It makes sense that for a length of time. Okay, so you can't find, when you look for the actual abiding, for the present abiding, you don't find the present moment. So true. But you also don't find the actual ar having arisen that moment we don't find and ceasing, and we don't find that either. And so therefore, when you look closer, none of those can be found. But all of them make sense. Something has arisen because previously it wasn't there and now it's there. Like I said, and it abides because although it changes moment by moment, but during those moments, we continue to call it sprout. Conventionally, it just happens to be called a sprout for like, I don't know, a whole day before we apply a different term, for instance. And so therefore, it's abiding Although it's different from moment to moment, still we call it sprout. So we say it abides. But it also ceases at the same time because it nears the end of its own existence by way of changing, of course. But not just that. It, it, it's moment by moment. It's different. So it's changing moment by moment. In that way, each moment lasts only for a certain period and then it gives rise to the next moment and next moment and so forth. So it ceases constantly until it goes out of existence. So all three are valid because the basis of imputation is given. Is this also just a conventional truth? Yes, yes, it's a conventional truth. So why can't we say that a higher or there is higher conventional truth of the yogi overrides the lower? No, you wouldn't use that terminology the terminology that is used that that is usually used for all phenomena is a manifest phenomenon, a slightly hidden phenomenon, and a very hidden phenomenon, or an obvious phenomenon, a hidden or very hidden phenomenon. So there are 
the obvious. Yeah, we look at the world, something comes into existence, then it remains for some time, and then it goes out of existence. That is on a coarser level. That's obvious. But then on a subtler level, like you, as, as you said, on the level of subtle impermanence, that is slightly hidden. So therefore, it's, it's a, a, a hidden conventional truth for ordinary people, not immediately obvious or immediately understood. So you have to apply reasoning, you have to apply uh, contemplation. Why can't both the valid conventional truth at different times for different, why can't both be valid conventional truth at different times for different individuals? Well, they can be. The first here, this is a valid conventional truth, except it's coarser. And the, the, having arisen and abiding and ceasing happening simultaneously, that is subtler. So they're both valid truth. Many examples of that, you know, like death is a coarse form of impermanence. It's obvious to us. It's a conventional truth. A subtler version is every moment is the end of one thing. It's the death, if you like, of one situation, the beginning of something new. Whereas death, that what we usually call death, yes, that's called like the end of this life. Of course, the beginning of something new at the same time. But um, we just look at it as one state in our life. But in actuality, every day is a new day. We have to leave behind what was, there, what was there before. Our body changes from day to day, from minute to minute, from second to second. So on the settler level, that process of having to leave something behind in order for something else to newly arise happens all the time, right? Otherwise, death wouldn't happen. It's not like your whole life is always the same and then suddenly it's gone, right? Because there's this subtle change, Therefore, you have the course change. And for different individuals, yeah, if it's coarser, it's just hard. It's easier to, to perceive. Okay. Anyway, I hope that answered those questions. And I really like these questions because it he thinks of these ideas from different angles. And it allows me to uh, go into some of these aspects and, and just clarify them once again because I'm just taking that as a given as we go through the material. Anyway, all right, let's then continue with exactly that, the material. No, that's the wrong, that's it. Okay, now I think this drawing by now you're familiar with it. I added it to some material that we already went through. Um, but anyway, so I don't need to go through it again, but I want to continue now with verse number four. Okay, so what we've done so far, it's been arising all the way through. And as I said, it's a slightly odd term, but hopefully it's a little clearer why it's talking about coming into existence, starting with that, um, being the first chapter. So the whole text starts with this. What we've heard about Arising, of course, inherent arising, that's what we're interested in, because the other extreme views of arising from itself, arising from something that is both itself and inherently different, and arising without a cause, those we can relatively easy, easily refute. But inherent existence, boy, that is so deeply ingrained in our mind, in our way of looking at the world, it's much harder. The beginning we heard, if something arises inherently from something inherently different, then they're totally unrelated. We heard about that. Okay, in the very beginning. Then in verse 3, we went through, well, if something exists, uh, arises as inherently different, arises from something inherently different, and it inherently arises, well, the cause and its effect have to exist at the same time. You heard that kind of argument. So whether you say they're inherently, uh, it's something uh, arises inherently, that arising of something, it has to exist, that something. Uh, otherwise, why would it be arising? Arising of what? So in that moment, it's inherently existent. Therefore, in that moment, that, that which arises has to be there, which would mean... At the time of the, the seed, the sprout has to be there. We've also heard about them being inherently different. And again, here it's 
very important that we distinguish between the time of the cause, the time of the effect. Although they're merely labeled, but still on a conventional level, there's the time of the cause and the time of the, the result. And to really have a clear sense of them that they cannot exist at the same time. If a rising existed inherently, if a cause and its effect were inherently different, they would have to exist at the same time. So that's an absurdity that was extensively dealt with in verse 3. Now let's move on to verse 4. Okay. All right, we've gone through all this. So verse 4 is then on page, oh, page number gone, 27. All right, now we have some philosophers. Later on, if we were told that it's the grammarians, they called their grammarians, uh, some non-Buddhist school, but that's not the point here. It's not so much about, like I said, it's not about understanding these non-Buddhist philosophical schools. It's about recognizing certain views within ourselves. And this view here, I'll explain it first, and it's really nice, like, you, you, this view is presented in such a way that it kind of also makes sense. But let's see first. Okay, so some philosophers misapprehend Nagarjuna's refutation of arising from something different in verse 3. They assert that Nagarjuna is not refuting inherent arising in general. They would say everything arises inherently, so therefore it can't be refuted. They would say, but they would say that inherent arising of a result, what is it? What is refuted? Inherent arising of a result that arises directly from its conditions. What does directly here mean? Directly means there's nothing in between. So remember that picture we had before? The drawing, the illustration we had before? Just go back to the one here. So these are the direct causes because they directly give rise to an eye consciousness. So mental consciousness, that is mental or sense consciousness, that is a moment before the eye consciousness. And then you have the uncommon empowering condition, these two interacting in Tibetan, like I said, it's like these two meet, they would say, but really it's like they interact, the object and the sense power, they interact. There's also a moment of awareness at that time. And these three directly give rise to an eye consciousness. There's nothing in between. That would be a direct, being directly giving rise directly to an eye consciousness. Okay. Having said this, all right. Now some would say, oh, you can't refute. You can't refute inherent arising because the the rising some the coming something coming into existence or rising exists inherently but they say that the causes and conditions that give rise to something they don't directly give rise to that object there is something in between there is the activity of arising According to these philosophers, there's no result that arises directly from its conditions because results arise directly from actions. That's weird, right? They hold that conditions produce, so conditions such as seed and water and fertilizer, they produce an ontologically separate and inherently existent action of arising. So an activity, an action of coming into existence. And it is this activity that directly produces a result. Okay. Well, let's see, let's look at this. So an eye consciousness here, they don't talk about sprouts and seeds any longer. But an eye consciousness perceiving a tree, for instance, does not arise directly from its, they would say, does not directly arise from its immediately preceding condition, a previous moment of awareness, its uncommon condition, the eye sense faculty, it's here, and its observed condition, the tree. Instead, they maintain these three conditions generate the action of arising. They give rise to the coming into existence of the sprout, sorry, <laughs> of the eye consciousness, 
which in turn gives rise to the eye consciousness perceiving the tree. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if that was the Buddhist view, if we weren't used to it in, in, a, in a different way, because from a Buddhist point of view, arising happens at that time. They, that, that happens all together. But especially when we talk about arising a lot, it's, it kind of separates it from the causes. And in a way, we think of it separately and maybe even get a sense it does exist separately. So according to this view, causes and conditions, such as the immediately preceding condition, the uncommon dominant condition, and the observed condition are called conditions because they engender, they produce the action of arising of a result such as this, which then directly produces the result. So the arising, the coming into existence of the eye consciousness, that directly, without anything interfering here, gives directly rise to the eye consciousness. But these three, they don't directly give rise to the eye consciousness because something is in between them. That's only by way of first giving rise to the coming into existence and then giving rise to the eye consciousness. Okay. So, Again, if you're not that familiar with that, you may think, oh, what the heck, like uh, rising, it's so weird anyway. But it does make sense. If if those three, these three perform, perform a function, everything that is a permanent performs a function. And so what is what do they do conventionally? They perform the function of producing a mind. But if you have the production of a mind, then that mind must also be arising. It must come into existence. So conventionally, it makes perfectly sense to talk about these three produce the eye consciousness and the eye consciousness, because there's this interaction between the, the cause and the effect. There's an object that is being produced. Well, what does the object do? It arises. It comes into existence. So that these activities take place, there's no doubt. But here there's a sense the rising of the eye consciousness is, is in between. Okay, between the actual result and those three causes. And now the analogy is really beautiful that they use. The analogy is cooking rice. Although when you cook rice, a person, I mean, unless you have some kind of robot, usually it's a person preparing the rice. You've got a container, you've got water and so on. They are needed to prepare a plate of rice. So the person, the container, the water, they're like the three conditions here. So they're needed. These are considered to be conditions that give rise to the action. So, so what do they do? These are considered to be conditions that give rise. What do they produce the action of boiling the rice. So these three, they lead to the boiling of the rice and only that produces the cooked rice, right? So here you have the cook, the pot, everything you need to prepare the rice. And then you put it on the stove and it starts to boil. And it's that boiling. That is really what produces the, the, the rice. So in this case here, also they say, You've got all the conditions, and that gives rise to an action. An action. They don't say which performs the action. They don't have anything there. Just the action takes place. And then you've got, in this case, the eye consciousness, or in the case of the example, uh, it gives rise to the rice. It produces the rice. Okay. Now, the question is, of course, why does Nagarjuna mention this, this view? We can only guess here. Maybe at the time when Nagarjuna composed this text, many of his disciples were influenced by this view, or maybe some of his disciples followed that view. But also what it does, and especially preparing this material, it kind of puts the focus on the arising. It is no longer happening together with its the causes that the arising takes place, it's given a special place. So it allows you to focus more on it, understand it better, and also understand that it doesn't exist inherently. That's just my guess, but it's, it's still helpful uh, for the time being. All right. Now, 
Having introduced this view, so from a Buddhist perspective, this tenet, whose proponents belong to the non-Buddhist school of the grammarians. So they, they, they dealt a lot with the Sanskrit grammar. It's not that much known about them. I did some research on them, but I didn't find too much about it. It's a lot about the language, the power of Sanskrit of course, the grammar, how the the Vedas are set forth and so forth. But they weren't just interested in that. They were also philosophers in their own right. Anyway, so it's this view, Lama Tsongkhapa says, is the, the school of the grammarians um, who set forth this view. Well, it's not tenable. It doesn't make sense. Because, well, it doesn't make sense that there should be a time when the three conditions – such as the immediately preceding condition, exist, but consciousness doesn't arise from them directly. Or a time when the arising of consciousness takes place, but the three conditions have ceased. Okay, so this would be the time, at that time, the arising of consciousness doesn't take place because this time it's not there yet, right? So this is this is basically this is the cause of of the arising of consciousness. So the three conditions are the cause of the arising of consciousness, and the arising of consciousness is the cause of the I consciousness. Which would mean that at the time of the three conditions, there's no production, there's no arising of the I consciousness, and at the time of the arising of the I consciousness, there are no causes. And so this is basically the argument here um, by Nagarjuna that it doesn't make sense that at the time that there should be a time when the three conditions exist but consciousness doesn't arise or a time when the arising of consciousness takes place but the three conditions they have ceased they're no longer there this reasoning is based on the fact that if causes such as the three conditions if they hypothetically were to generate an arising of consciousness, the three conditions would necessarily be the causes of that arising and thus could not exist simultaneously with it, which is why yeah, at the time of the three conditions, there would be no arising. And at the time of arising, the three conditions would no longer be present. Okay, it's pretty straightforward, right? So I've reformulated it again and again, just because it's sometimes so terse and so abstract uh, just to have some time to, to think about it. Therefore, although the arising of consciousness depends on the three conditions, arising is not produced by the three. So the arising of consciousness, of course, depends on the three conditions. So the three conditions and ri arising, they actually happen at the same time. But arising is not produced by the three. It's not the case that the coming into existence of consciousness is preceded by the three conditions, which means there's no rising of consciousness that exists between the time of the existence of the three conditions and the existence of consciousness. It doesn't interfere. It's not between the two as here, like it's in between those two. That's not the case. Instead, the three conditions and the arising of consciousness exist simultaneously and directly give rise to consciousness. Okay, so having said this, so this is clear so far. It is important to understand that each of the three conditions of an eye consciousness, perceiving a tree, for instance, performs the function of producing that eye consciousness. The immediately preceding condition, the eye sense faculty, and the tree each give rise to the eye consciousness perceiving the tree. They all together give rise. They all, I mean, they can only do it together. But then we would individually say, because they're individually causes, they produce the eye consciousness. It's a little weird to say produce. It's like this word we have, it has a different connotation in day-to-day -day life, but they cause the eye consciousness. They generate it. They give rise to or produce it. So those words are used here interchangeably. So since each of the three conditions produce the eye consciousness together, each one also facilitates the arising or coming into existence of the eye consciousness as they are changing. So what are they doing? They're really just changing. They're not like, like 
animate objects thinking, oh, I should be producing this eye consciousness now. No, of course not. That's not what this is saying, but the performer function, it can be called producing, giving rise to, um, and therefore they give rise to the eye consciousness. In fact, the three conditions, the individual function of producing the eye consciousness and the action of arising of the eye consciousness, which is brought about by the three conditions, exist simultaneously. Okay. And the action of arising of a result, the causes and conditions of the result. So the producing, the arising, and the causes and conditions, they're all of one nature. They're all of one nature. Okay. If you look at this drawing, I'll, I haven't finished this. I'm, I, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll, I'll finish in a moment, and I'll go over a little bit more. I mean, I have to say it once again. But here you have this. This is, you can label on the basis of each of those causes, you can label it's producing the eye consciousness perceiving a tree, and therefore the eye consciousness perceiving the tree arises in that moment. But all those are inseparably linked. They're inseparably linked. They're of one nature. One cannot be without the other, in other words, in that they they're, they form this entity in a sense, like not just not one entity, but they're they're inseparably linked, just as the impermanence of a tree and the tree are inseparably linked, are of one nature. Okay, all right. This is a lot of information, at least the very last bit. I hope I didn't go um, too far. But what this what 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 is stressed here? I'll just uh, summarize what we've talked about. Well. Basically, what I spoke about today wasn't that much. I spent a lot of time answering questions. We spent some time on the lum room. But basically, a view was presented to us today, which is the view of the grammarians, separating out arising. Okay, which makes it easier a little bit. The focus is more. It's kind of separated out. It's over there, this totally different action. Um which helps us to focus on it better on one hand, yes. But on the other hand, it actually doesn't make sense. Because arising is not some inherent entity, as the grammarians would say. They, they, they believe there's this inherent, concrete arising taking place. No, that is merely labeled on the basis of these three conditions. So on the basis of the three conditions, on the basis of the three conditions, we label each of the conditions is producing the eye consciousness, and we label the eye consciousness is arising. Because a moment later after it has arisen, it definitely has arisen. So if something has arisen, it must be preceded by the arising, right? We, we, in, in, in conventional terms, after you have understood something, there must have been the time when you were understanding it. So the three times, we think of three times when we use verbs. So there's the time of the fire being lit and the fire, the time when the fire uh, was lit in the sense of like, the process of lighting the fire took place in the present. And then afterwards, the fire was lit. Okay. Or the future. I mean, the future present here is not used at all. Like in the future, there'll be a rising. In the future, when all the causes and conditions are there for an eye consciousness to arise. So let's say you have the tree of the eye sense faculty and the immediately preceding condition. At that time, at that time is the arising of the eye consciousness. But before those three came together, it was about to be, it was in the future, it lay in the future. So it's about to arise. It will arise. And then when the three conditions are there, it is arising. And when the result has come into existence, you say it has come into existence. It has arisen. Now, in daily life, we mix those three. We, we, we're not that precise, especially with the present and the past. Um, but in, in philosophical terms, it's important to be, I mean, to be precise about using when do you use the present, when do you use the past. All right. So arising, having arisen. 
Um, and we're just at the very beginning of this view. So I would suggest if you have the time, whenever I have some material ready, read it in advance because it's it's not easy. And sometimes you have to read it three or four times. I said that a number of times, but still it, it really makes a difference um, reading it a couple of times. So we're going into uh, more reasonings on why phenomena uh, don't exist inherently why even arising there's nothing to point at anyway if you read in advance um yeah you'll you get a sense of what the reasoning is about but this was more like a preparation for what is to come next week okay all right and of course you're very welcome any time to ask questions um, it's helpful for everyone, I think, even if you know the answer, but just hearing it once again, and uh, it, it helps to give you a bit, of a bit of a background that is not necessarily part of Nagarjuna's text. Yes, okay. yes please. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, so in this example of the boiling of the rice, yeah. so for the grammarians, are they saying that the boiling part is inherently mm -hmm. existent in that example? Yes. Everything is inherent existence for them. Everything exists inherently. So everything is inherently existing. But the focus, they say, yes, arising is definitely inherently existent, right? So here the focus is on arising. And they would say, yeah, there's this inherent process of boiling taking place. Very concrete. Yeah. They wouldn't say it doesn't depend on anything. It's like yeah. this, this contradiction, of course, but it exists in and of itself. It just happens. It's not merely labeled and so forth. It's, it's really there. Yeah. yeah. And, and they go as far as, as saying it's an ontologically separate entity. So I, I have not read the rest of the argument, but I'm just wondering how does it help them refute Nagarjuna's point? Like I'm still... No, no, it's not how, about that. Is, no, no, it's not about them refuting Nagarjuna's point. It's about us refuting them. Is Nagarjuna refuting them? Because for us, we may recognize within ourselves. This is the whole point. We don't care about the grammarians. The grammarians are never going to read this, right? I mean, it's put together in this text for us to understand the grammarians and go, do I have a similar sense of this concrete coming into existence? Like so concrete that has separated from its causes. You have its one nature with the causes and condition. It's kind of like, it's not as concrete, right? It's like, it's one nature. That's what the Buddhists would say. But no, it's ontologically different. There's a whole arising. So, Recognize in your own mind this philosophical system of making arising so concrete, so concrete that even in terms of the time of its arising, it left behind the causes and conditions, and there it is on its own, right? It gives us, it gives us the opportunity. Do I have that sense as well? And if it's just for a few split seconds, you know, we do that as well. Like Sometimes when we perceive something to be inherently existent, we separate it from its causes and conditions. Oh, those are in the past, right? Um, even if it's something that exists at this, oh well, yeah, anyway, th that's true in the case of the cause and conditions, they are in the past. But even if it's something that actually arises, exists at the same time, is the same nature as something else, in our mind, we separate it. Our conceptual mind separates it and gives it much more of a concrete existence than it actually has. So the grammarians, they hold a mirror to our face, or Nagarjuna uses the grammarians to hold a mirror to our face and says, ah, ah, do you find yourself in the grammarians, right? All these non-Buddhist schools are meant for that. And so when you read them, what's good to, to do is like, try to like them try to go like there's something there i'll find i'll find something there that makes sense try to really understand them and before long you go oh yeah i do that oh right i mean lots of examples we don't have the time to go into all these examples but when you read these non-buddhist ones as part of our studies you find that after some time when you learn these non-buddhist schools you recognize yourself in them 
And that's the whole point. And then Nagarjuna says, see, this is how you, pre-. it doesn't make any sense. First of all, to separate it out in such a way doesn't make sense. And that's not the main point of the argument. I kind of expanded it a little bit. I mean, <laughs> Nagarjuna, it's just, it's just based on that. And even the ocean of reasoning, yeah, it spent some time on that. Actually, Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary does explain that quite extensively. And I, what I wrote in there is all based on what Lama Tsongkhapa said. Um, it does spend some time with it, but that's not the whole point. It's just to get this image concrete, right? I mean, you see, it takes so much time. We're, we're spending so much time with every image, but we need to because our self, no, our wrong view is so deeply ingrained in each moment. It reinforces itself. It reinforces itself. So we're almost like pressing this slow motion, right? Arising causes and conditions here and then arising. How concrete does it appear to me? This coming into existence. Now, if you think, what do I care about arising? What do I care about coming into existence? Well, once you understand that action, that activity, you then bring it to other thinking. Thinking seems to be so concrete. My mind is thinking, right? So concrete. Just label, just label, right? These actions, moments based on which we label. So Nagarjuna spends a lot of time taking actions and analyzing them, right? So it's like this big puzzle of inherent existence. Each piece of our puzzle of our perception of reality reinforces inherent existence. And now he takes every puzzle piece and he says, no, it doesn't exist inherently, it doesn't exist inherently, right? Does that make sense? Yes. And I think you just made me realize something about, um, you know, how I myself, like I would never, I, I would think boiling rice. I would never think, oh, boiling is inherently existent or whatever. Like, but I'm not thinking that way, like you said, about my own thoughts or other people. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's 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 using that example of the boiling rice. Mm-hmm. And that's how everything is. And mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. is like boiling rice. <laughs> Right, right. Yes, every activity. So the thing is also don't think of it with your with your Prasangika head on. Right? That's what I keep saying. With our Prasangika head on, yes, but that's not how we live our lives. Oh, it's boiling. There seems to be this like you're totally not thinking of Prasangika. You just mm-hmm. live your life influenced by your emotions and everything. That's what's that's our daily life. And then look at this rice pot as it's cooking away. And on an unconscious, on a more subconscious level, right? It's not necessarily the the coarse thought. You go right away, oh yeah, I'm a prison geek person. And but no, recognize, and these thoughts, we don't even recognize them. On such deep levels, there's so much happening. And we want to also access these levels. So we recognize, first of all, how on a subtler level there are these wrong views that make us act. We're not even aware. That's what it's not our present Giga had kind of mind every every now and then that that influences my actions. No way. And if you insult me, present Giga is gone. You're inherently this, that, and the other. Right? Let's not underestimate our incredible deep misapprehension. So deep within us. So Nagarjuna does this incredible thing. It's like he's almost digging, helping us to dig deeper into our own mind. It, it sounds really dramatic here, but I think that's 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 what he's trying to do. And yeah, so like I said, I said it last time as well. We need to recognize through mindfulness, mindfulness here, of course, very important. If we bring Nagarjuna's thoughts, Nagarjuna's text into our daily life to apply mindfulness and try to recognize, you know, when you're just so craving this rice, the boiling is taking place. Oh, thank you for the boiling of the rice. And you may actually find your own mind, without you reflecting on this, perceiving this inherent action there. And of course, as you say, 
with other things like thinking and meditation anyway, but even with something as minor as boiling rice. It's there. It's there. It's, it's, it's the, the self, the, 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 sorry, the misapprehension. It's got its, its, its fangs right in there. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, does that make sense? Okay, great. Yeah. Whoops. Oh, that went a little faster than I... Okay. All right. Actually, to be honest, I don't know what to debate, uh, what to meditate on, the rising and the grammarians. So maybe let's leave it for today because next time there's more on it. So my apologies if it's, um, yeah, if we don't have a meditation, it's been a few times now that we didn't have it. But anyway, we'll do it next time. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, so all that is left few minutes we've got left let's take a moment to just relax just let go of any thoughts other than our focus on the breathing to get ready for the dedication And then let's think whatever positive potential we've accumulated together here today by studying and reflecting on this particular part of the text. May this once again become a cause for us to become fully enlightened, to become just like the Buddha himself not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of each and every sentient being. And in order to reach that resultant refuge, we need the causal refuge. We need our realized masters in the form of the different lamas, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all the other great masters. So let's pray, let's dedicate our positive potential towards their long and healthy lives so that they continue to teach us through their words and through their example. And then may whatever virtue, whatever positive potential we've accumulated, may that also have an impact right here, right now, in terms of all other sentient beings. So may this in particular uh, be beneficial in terms of changing people's behavior when it comes to the environment. May it have an impact so people, especially those in leading positions, will make decisions in such a way that there'll be less catastrophes, uh, less problems that lead to injury and death. So may people's thoughts really change. Especially when it comes to the climate. So with that in mind, let's recite the prayers. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi, Dinzing Yatsu, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Oh, and I forgot to mention, of course, 
So especially dedicate all those for all those who are sick, whether mentally or physically, like Geshe Punzok and like Tali Lubin and like all other sentient beings who suffer in similar ways. All right, thank you. So hope you'll have a great week. Please read the material if you have the time. And then I'll see you again mm. next week. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you